Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am very excited and grateful to be part of this event. My name is Susana Contrera, and I have been working at Meta for almost 10 years. I am part of the Physical Infrastructure Network Engineering team, where our main role is translating network designs from whiteboards into the real world. Today, Haney and I are going to tell you the story about how Meta's network has evolved to support AI. Let's go quickly over the agenda. I will first start with some AI basics. Then we will go over our data center design and some of the difference between regular server racks and AI racks. After that, I will talk about some of the challenges that we faced, and then Haney will dive into the backend fabric evolution. Let's get started with some AI basics. AI is, of course, the hot topic of the moment. Everyone is talking about it. But what are we actually trying to do when we build artificial intelligence infrastructure? What is AI? It's a field of computer science that is trying to teach computers to reason and make decisions like a human would without explicitly telling them what to do and when. AI has become an integral part of our daily lives, and it is present in multiple activities that we perform, sometimes without even realizing that AI technology is behind it. Different teams at Meta leverage AI to perform some important functions. From content moderation and recommendations to metaverse and video filters, the main objective is always creating value for people and improving the user experience. One of the most important benefits of AI is it allows us to perform all these tasks at scale, significantly reducing the time that they will take if this had to be done by humans. So we said before that with AI, we are trying to make computers make decisions like humans would. This, of course, requires intensive training, and we do this using machine learning models. What is an ML model? It is basically an algorithm that is capable of going through large amounts of data and find patterns to make predictions or decisions. ML models were originally designed to run on CPUs. As model complexity increased, the time to complete these training jobs also increased. This is what triggered the transition from using CPUs to GPUs or graphic processing units. The main difference between a CPU and a GPU is that the CPU is optimized for carrying out serial tasks, where the GPU is optimized to carry out parallel tasks. This parallelization is what reduces the amount of time that it takes for training jobs to complete when we're using GPUs. So we said before that model complexity and size keeps increasing as technology evolves, right? But what does that mean from a data center infrastructure perspective? It means, of course, increased demand for resources. It means more compute, more memory, more bandwidth. Using a single GPU no longer will make sense, but instead we need a group of GPUs working together what we typically know as a training cluster. The machine learning model needs to see all these resources working as a single unit, and these resources need to be interconnected by a new network that it's very low latency and minimal packet loss. That's where the backend fabric comes in. Originally, we had our regular server racks connected to our data center fabric, as you can see on the left. Now we have this new type of rack, the AI racks, that will contain GPUs. They will, however, also connect to the front end, but mainly for data ingestion purposes. The new backend fabric is the new network that will allow the GPUs to talk to each other directly. For this, a new top of the rack switch called RTSW will be part of these AI racks. Let's take a look at Meta Data Center's infrastructure. This is a depiction of our standard Meta Data Center, originally designed to support regular OCP server racks. In general, we have four large server rooms or data halls. The data center fabric is spread across multiple network rooms. The first one of them, the main distribution frame, serves as the first network aggregation point for all the server racks sitting in the data hall. The BDF or building distribution frame contains the rest of the data center fabric. Each MDF will connect to the network core using four fully redundant fiber paths. And there is, of course, a standard design for each one of these rooms in terms of physical capabilities. We're talking cooling, space, power, and fiber. 
resources that need to be taken into consideration every time that we introduce a new network product. And AI is, of course, not an exception. Infra was presented with the challenge of introducing the support for AI racks. We need to get this new backend fabric deployed in real life and coexist in harmony with our existing data center fabric. For this, we're going to create small zones in each one of these data holes, and there is going to be this new layer called CTSWs that will be co-located in the MDF to allow all these GPUs in the same zone or data hole to talk to each other. Let's go over some of the challenges that we faced. First, from a space perspective, do we have enough space available for these additional devices? What is the best location for them? Do we need to combine devices in the same rack or not? From a power perspective, the GPU racks are almost two times as power hungry as a regular rack. So how much power in total do we require? Do we need a different type of tab boxes in our bus bars? Do the, does the electrical system need any type of upgrade to support the additional load? How do we distribute racks and network devices to balance all the power load? From a cooling perspective, do we require liquid cooling or not? From a connectivity perspective, right? What type of optics are we going to use? What type of fiber is required? How many ports do we need to connect these devices? Do we need to install additional fiber or a new type of fiber? If we need to interconnect multiple AI zones together to form an even larger AI zone, how do we do this? And do we have enough fiber to do that? In our case, we were able to leverage the existing fiber plant in these buildings, which allows us to avoid complex and time-consuming retrofit work. And last but not least, from an automation perspective, once all the physical design is finalized, we also need to fine-tune all the tooling aspects of these systems to support this new technology. From modeling to provisioning, deployment planning, and execution, all the operational tools like monitoring, ticketing, troubleshooting, and maintenance need to come together for this new network to be able to go into production. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Haney. Thank you, Susanna. Hi, I'm Haney Morsi, a network engineer at Meta, and I will go over the back-end fabric evolution. Our network infrastructure at Meta has undergone a remarkable transformation in the recent years. Initially, our model training took place on individual servers. However, as our data sets expanded and as our models have become more complex, the necessity for distributed GPU-based systems became evident. Our initial GPU clusters utilized the Rocky V1 protocol where RGMA packets were encapsulated within the Ethernet Layer 2 header and transmitted over basic Layer 2 non-routable networks. To enhance the scalability and accommodate larger training tasks, we swiftly transitioned to routable back-end fabric. The back-end network is independent of the front-end DC network and dedicated to training the, the workloads. This fabric is highly adaptable, capable of accommodating thousands of GPUs within the same job without any oversubscription between them. Let's begin by highlighting the general characteristics and requirements of RGMA as a service in the next slide. The RGMA service possesses distinct characteristics that differentiated from traditional TCP-based services. These unique aspects must be considered when designing the network infrastructure for AI traffic transport. To achieve optimal performance in RGMA, it's crucial to have a lossless network interconnecting the GPUs. Characterized by low latency and reliable packet delivery in the correct order. In the realm of RGMA, there exists two primary transport mechanisms. RGMA over converged Ethernet, Rocky, and InfiniBand. At Meta, we have invested in both technologies to meet our diverse needs. InfiniBand achieves the desired properties through its end-to-end -end flow control mechanism and adaptive routing, while Rocky relies on priority flow control, PFC, to ensure lossless behavior on a hub-by-hub -hub basis. Additionally, Rocky V2 incorporates ECN, Explicit congestion notification in a delicate coordination with PFC, 
providing comprehensive end-to-end -end flow control and mitigating the potential for head-of-line blocking within the back-end network. Let's look closer at the topologies of the networks that we have built at Meta to support AI services. In this slide, we explore the initial cluster deployments for AI services at Meta. This design features a simple start topology in which the GPU hosts connect directly to a central Ethernet switch called the back-end training switch, or the BTSW. Each AI rack consists of two super nodes equipped with eight GPUs from the V100 generation, operating at 100 gigabit per second. Positioned within the same row as the super nodes, the BTSW serves as the nexus, interconnecting nine AI racks in the cluster at layer two using active optical cables, AOCs. AOCs were selected to extend the reach beyond the limitation of copper decks. It's important to note a couple of limitations with this early topology. Firstly, the BTSW represents a single point of failure for the entire cluster. Secondly, the cluster's scalability is capped at 144 GPUs, which is the maximum capacity of this design. Let's move on to explore the next generation of back-end fabrics that overcame these limitations and shortcomings. This slide presents an overview of our first generation back-end fabric topology. In contrast to the start topology we discussed earlier, this design incorporates a two-stage claw topology. Here, the GPU hosts are connected to leaf switches, while the interconnectivity between the leaf switches is provided by the spine layer. The leaf switch known as the RTSW, or the rack training switch, resides within the AI rack alongside two super nodes, and it connects to 16 a100 generation GPUs through copper decks operating at 200 gigabit per second. On the uplink side, the RTSW is connected to a group of CTSWs, cluster training switches, using single mode fiber and 400 gig optics. This network is undersubscribed and allows us to support thousands of GPUs per data hall. Let's take a look at the second generation of our AI fabrics. As we see in this illustration, the underlying architecture still follows the two-stage claw topology. But there are some notable differences in this generation compared to the previous one. One noticeable change is the upgrade of the RTSW downlinks to 400 gigabit per second, which aligns with the higher speed of the H100 model GPUs. As the undersubscription ratio got reduced in this generation, Due to the increased GPU speed, we expanded the spine tier to include additional CTSWs so that we continue to absorb the effects of random link failures and intentional CTSW drains. Another important consideration for this generation is the increased power demand of the GPUs, which led us to slightly reduce the maximum scale of AI racks per zone. This adjustment also allowed us to allocate extra ports on the CTSW switch to enable DC scale connectivity among the AI zones, as we will explore in the upcoming slides. In this slide, we introduce the concept of DC scale and its role in our infrastructure. As previously mentioned, we have one dedicated AI zone per data hall. To achieve a scale of more than 10,000 GPUs Per building, we rely on the DC scale network product, which interconnects the four AI zones within the data center. Each AI zone has its own set of CTSWs installed in the corresponding main distribution frame, or the MDF. The physical cabling between the four MDFs traverse through the two backbone distribution frame rooms, called the BDFs, within the same data center. This interconnected setup enables seamless communication and collaboration between the AI zones, maximizing our overall computational capacity. Let's take another look at this scale in 3D. 
In this alternative view of DC scale connectivity, we present the CTSW mesh in a three-dimensional representation. To facilitate interconnectivity between the CTSWs of different zones, each CTSW is equipped with a dedicated line card used for uplinking to CTSWs from the other three AI zones. The CTSWs positioned in the same order are fully meshed together, forming orthogonal planes. This mesh architecture allows for intercluster connectivity, ensuring efficient communication between the AI zones. It's important to note that the intercluster connectivity is oversubscribed by design. Balancing the network traffic using ECMP hashing to maintain optimal performance. So to sum it up in three data points, AI is not new at Meta, and its network has gone through tremendous evolution in the past few years. The new back-end fabrics come with challenges that we constantly need to meet to accommodate physical resources and newer compute generations. As we are building today's infrastructure, we are keeping an eye on the future and we are in the process of designing new data center generations that will be more agile and efficient. This concludes my portion of the slides. Thank you so much for listening.